Hello friends, I welcome you all to today's lecture on Nuisance in Law of Torts. The main objectives of this lecture are to understand the basic concept of nuisance, essentials of nuisance, types of nuisance and the defenses to nuisance. Nuisance as a tort means an unlawful interference with a person's use or enjoyment of land or some right over or in connection with it. Acts interfering with the comfort, health or safety are examples of it. The interference may include, for example, noise, vibrations, heat, smell, smoke, fumes, water, gas, electricity, excavation or disease producing germs. Nuisance is distinguished from trespass. Trespass is a direct physical interference with the plaintiff's possession of land through some material or tangible objects. The points of distinction between two are as follows. If interference is direct, the wrong is trespass. If it is consequential, it amounts to nuisance. Trespass is interference with a person's possession of land. In nuisance, there is interference with a person's use or enjoyment of land. Moreover, in trespass, interference is always through some material or tangible objects. Nuisance can be committed through the medium of intangible objects also. For example, planting a tree on another's land is trespass. But when a person plants a tree over his own land and the roots or branch project into or over the land of another person, that is nuisance. To throw stones upon one's neighbor's premises is a wrong of trespass. To allow stones from a ruinous chimney to fall upon those premises is the wrong of nuisance. Nuisance is of two kinds, public or common nuisance, private nuisance or tort of nuisance. Now friends, we will be discussing public nuisance. Public nuisance is a crime, whereas private nuisance is a civil wrong. Public nuisance is interference with the right of public in general and is punishable as an offense. Obstructing a public way by digging a trench or constructing structures on it are examples of public nuisance. For example, digging trench on a public highway may cause inconvenience to public at large. No member of the public who is thus obstructed or has to take a diversion along with others can sue under civil law. But if any one of them suffers more damage than suffered by the public at large, for example, if anyone is severely injured by falling into the trench, he can sue in tort. In order to sustain a civil action in respect of a public nuisance, Proof of spatial and particular damage is essential. The proof of spatial damage entitles the plaintiff to bring a civil action for what may be otherwise a public nuisance. Thus, if the standing of horses and wagons for an unreasonably long time outside a man's house creates darkness and bad smell for the occupants of the house and also obstructs the access of customers into it, the damage is particular, direct and substantial and entitles the occupier to maintain an action. In Dr. Ram Raj Singh vs. Babulal, the defendant erected a brick grinding machine adjoining the premises of the plaintiff, who was a medical practitioner. The brick grinding machine generated dust which polluted the atmosphere. The dust entered the consulting chamber of the plaintiff and caused physical inconvenience to him and patients and their red coating on clothes caused by the dust could be apparently visible. It was held that spatial damage to the plaintiff had been proved and a permanent injunction was issued against the defendants restraining him from running his brick grinding machine there. Now friends, we will be discussing private nuisance or tort of nuisance. To constitute the tort of nuisance, the following essentials are required to be proved. Unreasonable interference. Interference is with the use of enjoyment of land and damage. Unreasonable interference. 
interference may cause damage to the plaintiff's property or may cause personal discomfort to the plaintiff in the enjoyment of property. Every person must put up with some noise, some vibration, some smell, etc. so that members of the society can enjoy their own right properly. Every interference is not a nuisance. To constitute nuisance, the interference should be unreasonable. If I have the house by the side of the road, I cannot bring an action for the inconvenience caused due to the traffic on the road. Nor a person can sue his neighbor for listening to the radio so long as the interference is not unreasonable. In Radhe Shyam versus Gur Prasad, plaintiffs filed a suit against Radhe Shyam and others for a permanent injunction to restrain them from installing and running a floor mill. It was alleged that the said mill would cause nuisance to the plaintiffs who were occupying the first floor portion of the same premises in as much as the plaintiffs would lose their peace on account of rattling noise of the floor mill and thereby their health would also be adversely affected. It was held that substantial addition to the noise in a noisy locality by the running of the impugned machines seriously interfered with the physical comfort of the plaintiffs and as such it amounted to nuisance and the plaintiffs were entitled to an injection against the defendants. Sensitive plaintiff An act which is otherwise reasonable does not become unreasonable and actionable when the damage, even though substantial, is caused due to sensitiveness of the plaintiff or the use of which he puts his property. For instance, if certain kind of traffic is no nuisance for a healthy man, it will not entitle a sick man to bring an action if he suffers thereby even though the damage is substantial. If some noise which do not disturb or annoy any ordinary person but disturb only the plaintiff in his work or sleep due to his oversensitiveness, it is no nuisance against this plaintiff. In Robinson v. Gilbert, the plaintiff wear house brown paper in a building. The heat created by the defendant in the lower portion of the same building for his own business dried and diminished the value of plaintiff's brown paper. The loss was due to exceptionally delicate trade of plaintiff and paper generally would not have been damaged by the defendant's operations. It was held that the defendant was not liable for the nuisance. Nuisance is generally continuing wrong. A constant noise, smell, vibration is a nuisance and ordinarily an isolated act of escape cannot be considered to be a nuisance. In Stone v. Bolton, the plaintiff while standing on a highway was injured by a cricket ball hit from defendant's ground, but she could not succeed in her action for nuisance. At first instance, Justice Oliver said, an isolated act of hitting a cricket ball onto the road cannot of course amount to a nuisance. If the act of the defendant which is done with evil motive becomes an unreasonable interference, it is actionable. A person has right to make a reasonable use of his own property, but if the use of his property causes substantial discomfort to others, it ceases to be reasonable. If a man creates a nuisance, he cannot say that he is acting reasonably. The two things are self-contradictory. In Allen v. Flood, Lord Watson said, No proprietor has an absolute right to create noises upon his own land, because any right which the law gives him is qualified by the condition that it must not be exercised to the nuisance of his neighbors or of the public. If he violates that condition, he commits a legal wrong. And if he does so intentionally, he is guilty of a malicious wrong in its strict legal sense. Interference with the use or enjoyment of land. Interference may cause either injury to the property itself or 
injury to comfort or health of occupants of certain property injury to property an unauthorized interference with the use of the property of another person through some object tangible or intangible which causes damage to property is actionable as nuisance nuisance to incorporeal property consists of interference with the right of support of land and buildings a person has a natural right to have his land supported by his neighbor's land therefore removal of support lateral or from beneath is a nuisance the natural right from support of neighbor's land is available only in respect of land without buildings or other structures on land right to support by grant or prescription in respect of buildings the right of support may be acquired by grant or prescription it was observed in patridge versus scott that if a man builds a house at the extremity of a land he does not thereby acquire any easement of support or otherwise over the land of his neighbor he has no right to load his own soil so as to make it acquire the support of his neighbors unless he has a grant to that effect interference with right to light and air in england right to light is also not a natural right and may be acquired by grant or prescription when such a right has been acquired a substantial interference with it is an actionable nuisance it is not enough to show that the plaintiff's building is having less light than before in coles versus home and colonial stores the construction of a building by the defendant only diminished the light into a room on a ground floor which was used as an office and where electric light was otherwise always needed it was held that the defendant was not liable it was not sufficient to constitute an illegal obstruction that the plaintiff had in fact less light than before in order to give a right of action there must be a substantial provision of light in india also the right to light and air may be acquired by easement section 25 of limitation act 1963 and section 15 of indian easements act 1882 makes similar provision regarding the mood and period of enjoyment required to acquire this prescriptive right injury to comfort or health substantial interference with the comfort or convenience in using the premises is actionable as a nuisance a mere trifling or fanciful inconvenience is not enough the rule is de minimis non curate lex means that the law does not take account of very trifling matters there should be a serious inconvenience and interference with the comfort of the occupiers of the dwelling house according to notions prevalent among reasonable english men and women the standard of comfort varies from time to time and place to place inconvenience and discomfort from the point of view of a particular plaintiff is not the test of nuisance but the test is how an average man residing in the same area would take it the plaintiff may be over sensitive damage unlike trespass which is actionable per se actual damage is required to be proved in an action for nuisance in the case of public nuisance the plaintiff can bring an action in tort only when he proves a special damage to him nuisance on highways obstructing a highway or creating dangers on it or in its close proximity is a nuisance obstruction need not be total the obstruction must however be unreasonable thus to cause the formation of queues without completely blocking the public passage is a nuisance in barber versus penley due to considerable queues at the defendant's theater access to the plaintiff's premises a boarding house became extremely difficult at certain hours it was held that the obstruction was a nuisance and the management of the theater was liable projections as regards projections on the highway by objects like overhanging branch of a tree or a clock etc from the land or building adjoining the highway No action for nuisance can be brought for such projections unless some damage is caused thereby. 
In Noble v. Harrison, the branch of a beech tree growing on the defendant's land hung on the highway at a height of about 30 feet above the ground. In fine weather, the branch of a tree suddenly broke and fell upon the plaintiff's vehicle which was passing along the highway. For the damage to the vehicle, the plaintiff sued the defendant to make him liable for nuisance. It was held that there was no liability or nuisance because the mere fact that the branch of a tree was overhanging was not nuisance, nor was the nuisance created by its fall as the defendant neither knew nor could have known that the branch would break and fall. Now friends, we will be discussing defenses available to tort of nuisance. A number of defenses have been pleaded in an action for nuisance. Some of the defenses have been recognized by the courts as valid defenses and some others have been rejected as ineffectual defenses. Effectual defenses Prescriptive right to commit nuisance A right to do an act which would otherwise be a nuisance may be acquired by prescription. If a person has continued with an activity on the land of another person for 20 years or more, he acquires a legal right by prescription to continue therewith in future also. Section 15 of Indian Easement Act and Section 25 of Limitation Act 1963 says, A right to commit a private nuisance may be acquired as an easement if the same has been peacefully and openly enjoyed as an easement and as a matter of right without interruption for 20 years. On the expiration of this period of 20 years, the nuisance becomes legalized ab initio, as if it has been authorized by a grant of the owner of servient land from the beginning. Statutory Authority An act done under the authority of a statute is a complete defense. If nuisance is necessarily incident to what has been authorized by a statute, there is no liability for that under the law of torts. In Vaughan versus Taff Vale Rail Company. A railway company authorized to run railway trains on a track is not liable if, in spite of due care, the sparks from the engine set fire to the adjoining property. In Hammer Smith Railway Company versus Brand, it was observed that if there is negligence in the running of trains, the railway company, even though run under a statutory authority, will be liable. Ineffectual defenses Nuisance due to acts of others Sometimes the act of two or more persons acting independently of each other may cause nuisance, although the act of any one of them alone would not be so. An action can be brought against any one of them, and it is no defense that the act of the defendant alone would not be a nuisance, and the nuisance was caused when other had also acted in the same way. Public good. It is no defense to say that what is nuisance to a particular plaintiff is beneficial to the public in general. Otherwise, no public utility undertaking could be held liable for the unlawful interference with the rights of individuals. In Shelford v. City of London Electric Lightning Company, during the building of an electric power house by the defendants, there were violent vibrations resulting in damage to the plaintiff's house. In an action for injunction by the plaintiff, the defense pleaded was that if the building was not constructed, the whole of the city of London would suffer by losing the benefit of the light to be supplied through the proposed power house. The plea was rejected and the court issued an injunction against the defendants. Reasonable care Use of a reasonable care to prevent nuisance is generally no defense. In Rapier v. London Tramways Company, considerable stretch amounting to nuisance was caused by the defendant's stables constructed to accommodate 200 horses to draw their trams. The defense that the maximum possible care was taken to prevent the nuisance failed and the defendants were held liable. Plaintiff coming to nuisance it is no defense that the plaintiff himself came to place of nuisance. A person cannot be expected to refrain from buying a land on which a nuisance already exists, and the plaintiff can recover even if nuisance has been going on 
long before he went to that place. The maxim voluntary non-fit injuria cannot be applied in such a case. This was held in Elotion versus Friedman. While concluding, it may be said that nuisance as a tort means an unlawful interference with a person's use or enjoyment of land or some right over or in connection with it. With this, I conclude this lecture. Hope you have understood fully. Thank you.